really humbled to have invited, be, been invited to be on this panel because I had also never heard of TC Cannon and I am truly shocked by that fact. Um, and I'm happy to go last because I'm frankly mentally exhausted because I've learned so much in the last hour. I have so much to think about. Um, but with that, um, I will share with you my contribution to this conversation. So Native American, Chicano, African American, Asian American, and more recently, Latinx art. The mainstream art world, including museums, the academy, and the market, has often dismissed as special interest the work of artists who embrace their ethnic and political identities. Artists like T.C. Cannon, whose artistic vision was aesthetically and conceptually daring, but who were also committed to bringing visibility to their cultural communities' histories um, long on the margins of the so-called American experience. To say this is not to reduce these artists to identity politics. On the contrary, careful consideration of their lives and art brings forward the histories of oppression, state violence, and psychological, social, and physical torment that their communities have endured, histories that they invoked in their art. At the same time, we must also affirm their right to operate simply as artists as well. Yet it is their politics and the culturally specific characteristics of their art that has led the academy, many museums, and the market to dismiss their work as of marginal relevance, if not it, as of marginal relevance. <laughs> Garcia and Cesar Martinez, whose works you see here, <clears throat> both of whom are still active and working in the art world. Or for that matter, of Mel Casas, Salvador Torres, Josea Malakias Montoya, Robert de la Rocha, Gilbert Lujan, Frank Romero, Carl Carlos Almaraz, Amalia Mesa Baines, Yolanda Lopez, Esther Hernandez, Judith Hernandez, and Carmen Lo Lomas Garza. All artists of the Chicano movement generation who, like Cannon, came of age during the tumultuous decades of the 1960s and 70s. The list of Chicano and Chicana artists, whether pioneers of the movement or emerging still today, is long. I cite these artists in particular, however, because in one way or another, their experiences and their work resonates with that of T.C. Cannon. Before I proceed to discuss Rupert Garcia and Cesar Martinez, I want to be sure that the context from which I am working is clear. So what is a Chicano? In 1970, the Los Angeles Times investigative reporter Ruben Salazar, and this is his portrait over here, wrote an essay titled, Who is a Chicano and what is it that the Chicanos want? Salazar opened his essay with a declaration that, quote, a Chicano is a Mexican American with a non-Anglo image of himself. Salazar then enumerated the reasons why Chicanos were building a movement of political and cultural self-determination. He stated, for example, that, quote, Chicanos resented being told that Columbus discovered America, when in fact the indigenous ancestors of Chicanos, the Aztecs and the Maya, had founded highly sophisticated civilization centuries before Spain financed Columbus's trip to the so-called New World. Salazar then wrote, Chicanos resent Anglo pronouncements that they are culturally deprived, and he noted, why, some Mexican-Americans ask, can't we just call ourselves American? Because, Salazar said, Mexican-Americans were on the lowest rung in terms of education, economic, and political opportunity. And so he wrote, quote, Chicanos want change now. And they flaunt the barrio word Chicano as an act of defiance and a badge of honor. Chicanos, he concluded, are merely fighting to become American. ancestry. But if their ancestors were in parts of the U.S. that before 1848 belonged to Mexico, 
That ancestry was complicated by Spanish colonialism and by the unifying discourse of mestizaje, or ethno-racial mixture, that was already prevalent during Mexico's era of nation formation before 1848. And of course, not all Mexican Americans, politicized or not, claim the term Chicano. In New Mexico, the term Hispano, and in Texas, the term Tejano are still widespread and have their own politics. Today, the term and concept Chicano is further complicated by migration flows, including flows from other Latin American countries, such that many, but certainly not all, people of Latin American descent in the US, but especially urban youth, embrace the term Latino. And recently, the terms Chicanx and Latinx have emerged to express a refusal of patriarchy and an embrace of gender nonconformity. The X is also a way to acknowledge the complexity of a multiracial identity that was always not only white and indigenous, but also black, Asian, and even Native American tribal. So last, before I proceed, I want to address the gender bias of the term Chicano. As scholar Holly Barnett Sanchez has observed, in the early years of the social and cultural movement, the male gendered term Chicano was used to signify all forms and persons, sometimes even when specifically addressing the art of women. This seemed to work because the English language rarely genders its nouns with either articles or word endings, and English was quickly becoming, and is today, the predominant language of Chicanos. However, Chicano did not accurately, accurately reflect the participation of women in all aspects of the movement. Thus, inspired by the feminist movement, but also intent on giving specificity to their experience as racialized women, Chicana thinkers like Gloria Anzaldúa and Cherry Moraga emerged, offering powerful critiques of the patriarchy they experienced, both within and outside of their community and within the movement. And they made lasting contributions not just to the emergence of Chicana feminism, but to the emergence of what we now term woman of color and queer of color theory and criticism. Thus, I account for my use today of the term Chicano in the historical sense. So among the creative visual modes that emerged from the movimiento writ large were community murals, a tradition rooted in the post-revolutionary Mexican mural movement and the art of Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros and political graphics, also inspired by the Mexican example in the 1930s, but also the Cuban print and poster movement launched by Castro's 1959 revolution. But Chicano creative expression is more than community murals and political graphics. And it is first and foremost American art. It's not Mexican art, and it's not Latin American art. In what follows, I will discuss the work of Rupert Garcia and Cesar Martinez, and then I'll conclude with some observations about the politics of exclusion that have shaped the annals of American art. So, Rupert Garcia was born in French Camp, California in 1941, a small town in the predominantly agricultural San Joaquin Valley but he grew up in Stockton where he studied painting briefly at community college before enlisting in the US Armed Forces. His motivation in enlisting was simple. He was young, a working class kid from Stockton looking for a job, and for Garcia, the Air Force was quote, just a job. All the men in his family had served in the US military. At the time, he says, it was simple. The good guys and the bad guys. We Americans were the good guys, the communist Vietnamese were the bad guys. I totally, I was totally brainwashed to believe it, close quote. But today, Garcia also reflects on what he calls the war of racism, both in Vietnam and at home. He recalls the psychic impact of the so-called Zoot Suit riots in 1940s Los Angeles, when young Mexican Americans, called pachucos or Zoot Suiters, were racially profiled by the Los Angeles police and by young enlisted men on shore leave. And he also recalls the psychic trauma of the murder of Emmett Till. They were born the same year. After Garcia was released from the Air Force in 1966, he went to San Francisco State College, and there he earned a BA in painting in 1968 and an MA in printmaking in 1970. In 1981, he earned an MA in art history from UC Berkeley. While in San Francisco, Garcia became involved in the Third World Liberation Front and the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. Key issues were unequal access for Chicanos and blacks in public education, and also anti-Vietnam War protests, especially when it became clear that combat deaths for Chicano, Native, and black soldiers were much higher than for white soldiers. As we can see from the examples I've selected, which range in date from 1968 to 2017, 
Throughout his career, Garcia has appropriated the pictorial devices and premises of pop art, which he subverts from a Chicano, and as he terms it, third world perspective, to serve his aesthetic and ideological ends. His motivation was and remains very different from the cool detachment of much American pop. For example, Unfinished Man from 1968, which you see up here, is Garcia's most important early painting. The painting exemplifies his early adoption of the flat color and graphical shapes that have characterized both his painting and his prints throughout his career. Unfinished Man exemplifies his subver subversion of pop art's stylings, deployed in the service of a startling image of an unknown black man's face, appropriated by Garcia from a newspaper clipping, one of many in what he calls his picture morgue. Placed starkly against a painted field of blue sky, the man's head, mouth half, half open in a painful impending scream, has been dramatically and radically cropped. The upper portion of the man's head is engulfed by the beautiful but ominously empty blue sky. In response to this work, a critic once asked, quote, in what way is the man unfinished? And Garcia responded, the condition of racism in 1968 and still today makes it very difficult for black and other oppressed people to feel complete, to fulfill their human potential. That's what the picture is about, the human unfinished, unfinishedness that has been imposed. By the late 1960s, Garcia was already working intensely <clears throat> with ideological and art world subversion through appropriation, a strategy credited a decade later to the pictures generation of predominantly white artists. While studying for his MA in printmaking, he had already begun appropriating and manipulating mass media images, and he continued to do so when he returned to painting in 1970. In Political Prisoner, which you see here, which is also a print, but this is the painting, from 1976, he worked from a cover of Newsweek magazine that featured an image of a Vietnamese woman refugee that Garcia modified by placing a gag over her mouth. His painting of Inez Garcia, up here, the subject of a notorious trial in 1974 when she, a rape victim, was charged with and convicted of murdering her rapist. She was later exonerated. Was based, on a sensational, was based on the sensational media accounts of her arrest and trial. In these works and others, pop was a style and a tool whereby Garcia would signal the hostility people of color felt when confronted with consumer images depicting American society as monolithically white and upwardly mobile. Garcia thus describes his approach as anti-pop art, exemplified in works that render homage to cultural and political figures. In the lower left is his 1970 portrait of the aforementioned journalist Ruben Salazar, who was killed shortly after publishing his article, Who is a Chicano, for the LA Times. He was covering an anti-war protest for the Times when a tear gas projectile was randomly fired by a police deputy into the bar where Salazar had sought cover. Garcia's portrait of Salazar was designed from, designed from a photograph of the journalist that, that appeared in the media coverage about his tragic death. We see Salazar's progressively abstracted image that is painted with flat fields of vibrant color and the palette is decidedly 1970, mustard yellow, orange, red, and avocado green. Garcia recounts that he intentionally did not silk screen the painting to maintain a distance from what Andy Warhol was then doing. The portrait is also important in that it marks Garcia's return to painting after a period where he focused on political prints. His approach to Salazar's po portrait opened up a new direction for Garcia in terms of monumentalized graphic elements. The lush powdery flat color and the emotional intensity of the painting, which he pursued as a rejoinder to Warhol's reproducible silk screen portraits. For example, Marilyn Monroe, the Mona Lisa. In his portrait of Inez Garcia and in Political Prisoner, Garcia adapted his approach by applying color with more painterly strokes. In more recent works, such as Hoodwinked from, uh, from 2017, which is a self-portrait, Garcia reflects on American militarism and the complicity that comes from necessity among working class enlistees for economic opportunity. If Garcia's experience as an art student and then an artist and as a participant in the Third World and Chicano movements was more urban and centered in Stockton, San Francisco, and Oakland, 
Cesar Martinez typifies the Chicano experience of growing up and moving back and forth across the U.S.-Mexico border. He was born in 1944 in Laredo, Texas, where he also attended community college intending to go into business. But instead, he earned a BA in art education after transferring to Texas A&I in Kingsville. Martinez was drafted into the U.S. Army shortly after graduating in 1968, and his induction prevented him from attending the opening of his first solo exhibition, which he never got to see. His tour of duty was spent on an army base in Korea rather than in Vietnam. Following his discharge, Martinez decided to pursue a career as an artist, and he has since been based in Houston and San Antonio. Martinez is a portraitist. He is best known for a series of pachucos, vatos, and cholos, such as this one here. Insider terms for the barrio youth of both the Mexican-American generation of the 1940s and 50s and the Chicano generation of the 60s and 70s. While drawing inspiration from social types in his milieu, Martinez considers his portraits to be character studies that reflect not only on his community, but equally and always his interest in color field painting, particularly as, as exemplified by Mark Rothko, Kenneth Noland, and Jules Olitsky. In El Pantalón Rosa, or Pink Pants, Martinez renders homage to the fashion stylings of a vato, yet the black shirt, blue vest, and pink pants are rendered with a hard edge approach that serves to abstract the figure so that even if the composition is not, strictly speaking, liberated from objective content, a dynamic tension occurs between the figure and the flattened picture plane. Also highly original are works in his Sarapa series, such as this one that you see up here. A sarapa is, of course, a multicolored traditional Mexican blanket. As seen in Papalote I, in the upper right, the title of which translates as kite or butterfly, Martinez has transformed a familiar icon of Mexican rural culture through a dialogue with the lessons of op art and post-painterly abstraction. In Mona Lupe, which you see here, Martinez engages with two seemingly at odds cultural systems. Chan Noriega observes, quote, Martinez refigures the Mona Lisa as the Mexican Virgin of Guadalupe and as a self-portrait of the artist. It is these confluences of the old world and the new and of subsequent modernist masculinist reworkings in the manner of Marcel Duchamp as Rose Salavi or Warhol's Mona Lisa or his Marilyn's that Martinez identifies as the epitome of Chicano art. Thus Mona Lupe, like his oeuvre in general, allegorizes his effort to reconcile the political and cultural imperatives of the Chicano movement, reverence for Mexican culture over and above Anglo-American culture, with his own formal training and personal interest in abstraction. In the 1960s and 70s, it was difficult to be an artist of color, period. In the tumultuous era of civil rights, it was more difficult still for artists of color not to make work that reflected on the social, political, and cultural exclusion of their communities and on the mainstream's historical amnesia of their community's contributions to the American experience. Yet without fail, artists like T.C. Cannon, Rupert Garcia, and Cesar Martinez did just this, while also brilliantly affirming their contemporaneity through their interest in and commitment to reworking and rethinking aesthetic and conceptual experimentation and innovation, not just for its own sake, but for what such experimentation allowed them to affirm about the contemporary present of their own lives and that of their communities. So I have some long quotes here that I'd like to read. The first comes from Wanda Korn's extraordinary book, The Great American Thing where none of these artists are included. Now, in fairness, her book is really on the earlier period, but it's her last chapter, the epilogue, where I pull this quote. She writes, so many pop artists made art about art. The world of art was theirs to choose from, alongside comics and advertising. Scholars, too, in the 1960s were taking the first steps towards an art historical revisionism that is still playing itself out. It would in time collapse and discredit not only Clement Greenberg's narrow view of the history of American modern art, but also the legacy of American exceptionalism that lay behind it. Now, I appreciate Korn's scholarship very much, but I would say that while art historical revisionism is certainly still playing itself out, I wouldn't say that um, the narrow view has been entirely collapsed. I also have a doctorate in art history 
Admittedly, I was trained as a Mexicanist and a Latin Americanist in grad school. Um, I've retrained myself now as a Chicano and Latinx scholar, but I had never heard of T.C. Cannon. And then a quote from my friend, the extraordinary artist and scholar and critic, Amalia Mesa Baines, from her essay, Domesticana, from 1995. Amalia has written, Chicanos forged a new cultural vocabulary composed of sustaining elements of Mexican tradition and lived encounters in a hostile environment. Fragmentation and recombination brought together disparate elements such as corridos, Mexican historical ballads, images of Walt Disney, Mexican cinema, mass media advertising, and American pop art. This encounter of two worlds could only be negotiated through the sensibility of rascuachismo a survivalist irreverence that functioned as a vehicle of cultural continuity. And so what I want to say is that as, as I've been learning more about Native Studies and learning now about T.C. Cannon, I'm struck by the similarities between the concept of rascuache, which was most elaborated by the scholar Tomasi Barafrausto in 1988 uh, in an essay that has now been endlessly reprinted, but I'm really struck by the similarities between the way that Ibarra Frausto articulates rascuachismo and Visner's concept of survivance. So again, as we try to not just blur the lines, but just entirely violate the lines between fields, I think this is an area of really um, exciting and necessary and productive scholarly inquiry. Thank you. <laughs>